lovely to see you all. There are a number of faces that I don't recognise, so uh, that's nice to see as well. Just a couple of very brief announcements, please, before uh, we begin the service. Uh, communion will take place immediately after the, the, uh, the main part of the service, and Pastor Alan Marston will be taking that. So during the last hymn, we shall change over, as it were. Uh, and also, we are trying to observe still some form of social distancing in accord with the government regulations, but clearly it's a nice warm day outside, so we can at least gather there and, and talk to one another. Well, now let's just bow in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, our gracious, eternal Lord God, we thank you that you've gathered us together here this morning, and we plead with you to come and make yourself known to us and to reveal your word of truth and open our understanding to what you would say to us. We thank you that we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that for his sake you will glorify yourself amidst us this day. Amen. Amen. Turn please to your hymn books, and all the hymns this morning are from Redemption Hymnal, and the first one is hymn number six, The God of Abraham Praise, Who Reigns Enthroned Above. Number six, please. Bible with you please turn with me to the first book of Kings and the eighth chapter. First Kings and chapter eight. While you're searching for it just a quick word of explanation. 
just over two years ago now, in February 2019, I was here on that occasion and preached from this very chapter, but dealt really with the first six or seven verses, which deal with the Ark of the Covenant and the Temple, um, and the bringing of the Ark into the Temple when Solomon had constructed it. I said at the time, at least to one person at the end of the service, that I felt there was another message to preach from this chapter, and so far I haven't preached it, but I felt moved to do so for this occasion this morning. So we'll be turning back to the same passage, but not, I trust, the same message. I'm going to read from verse 1 of the chapter down to verse 13. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is in Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle, the priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, were the wings of the cherubim, for the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the, children, the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. May God help us as we turn back to that passage a little later on. Can we turn please to the hymn books once more, to our second hymn, which is uh, number 152. Join all the glorious names, 152. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love and power. 152 please.
that okay? I forgot at the beginning. Okay. Let's please turn to God in prayer and let's seek his face together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. You are the almighty, infinite and everlasting, eternal God. And there is none like him. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Way beyond our comprehension. You are the light in which no man can dwell. A presence which is a consuming fire. And yet, O oh, gracious God. Full of mercy, love and peace. You have made a way for us to approach you. We thank you for the precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank you that in him we have an introduction into your very presence and in him we are shielded from the very essence of your glory and yet we enjoy and rejoice in it and are able to praise and worship you. Father we thank you that you have dealt so kindly with us that you've taken our sin and laid it upon him who is the atonement for us. We've just considered your word of truth, a brief portion of it yet so full of meaning. Some of us may be able to cast our minds back those two years or more when we looked at that passage and considered the significance of the Ark of the Covenant and upon it laid that mercy seat with the cherubim looking down upon it and it spoke so clearly of Christ himself the mercy seat the atonement the covering for sin the propitiation the sacrifice which deals with our guilt and satisfies your wrath and enables us to enter into your presence as those clothed with the righteousness of Christ received blessed forgiven accepted and even adopted and made your very children father how wondrous is your mercy how glorious is your gospel and how precious and wonderful is your very being how is it that we mere mortals can enter into the sublime glory of god and enjoy your presence and yet so it is and we thank you, Father, and we lay before you our cares and petitions. We bring to you our prayers and our pleas. And first and foremost, we plead for the hallowing of your name, 
for the glory of all that you are to be known. We pray that you will visit the church, raise her up in power and strength, renew the life of your precious spirit within the souls of those that know you, that we might have uh, fresh uh, revealings of all that you are. Father, draw us close, envelop us with your love, embrace us in your arms, and enable us to know that we are your people. But Father, we plead for our nation. So sad as we gaze upon it, wallowing in its sin, wandering in its lost estate, and yet happy where it is. Oh, Father, forgive. Have mercy upon us. So deal with this nation, we plead. Raise up those who administer your word. Send them out in the power of your strength and bring in a great harvest of souls. We plead for our government. We ask that you would, they would, you would turn them to yourself. We pray that you would reveal to them that they, no matter how they may be in society, have need of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Turn them that they would seek your wisdom and your guidance and that they would uphold and observe your will and your perfect law. Father, turn this land back. Turn it back to yourself as you have done in many times in its history. We pray for ourselves. Make us a true witness a true image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Conform us each day to the image of what he is. May it be that every day we should draw closer to you. And Lord, we ask that you would so use us, making our testimony to be effective, that we would be an instrument in your power to draw souls to him who alone can save, whose blood alone can cleanse from the guilt of all sin. Oh, Father, hear our prayers. Bless as we plead. We pray for this very place. We thank you that for so long now you have been pleased to meet with people here. We pray for your pastor, that you would uh, enable him each week to minister faithfully, give him strength, put your word in his mouth, open his understanding, draw close to him and protect him and preserve him from all the wiles and attacks of the devil. And may he stand fast as a minister of one who is so great and wonderful. Lord, be gracious. Grant that there will be a people gathered here each week that will be longing to worship your name and praise all that you are. Father, preserve your testament in this place. Establish it, enlarge it, and make it most effective. We pray for every soul gathered here this morning and for all who might be listening and watching through the instrument of this technology. Father, visit such people. Touch them with your grace. For one drop of your grace can turn a soul from darkness to light and translate us from the kingdom of the evil one into the blessed <coughs> kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, enlarge that kingdom which you've given to your Son and bless his most holy name. Hear our prayers, we pray. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing one more hymn together, please, and then we're going to turn back to the passage that we were considering before. It's hymn 236, O Spirit of the Living God, in all thy plentitude of grace, where'er the foot of man hath trod, descend on our apostate race.
that passage in 1 Kings chapter 8 and uh, we're going to look more at verses 9 to 12. As I mentioned earlier, I spoke on the earlier verses of this passage here more than two years ago, but refrained from going further with the passage on that occasion and although I said I felt there was another message and I've been here at least two occasions since then, I haven't gone back to it. Perhaps one reason why that is the case, the message that I want to give to you this morning, God willing, can be taken in a wrong way. We need to be careful and guarded. We're handling God's word. We need to do so reverently and we need to realise that we must approach God reverently. And yet there is an important truth here, I believe. Let me begin by trying to get you to use your minds to think about something. I want us to think about a church, could be any church, not necessarily this one, but one perhaps you've attended in the past, or one perhaps you've visited, or one perhaps you've heard about. And in a sense, it's a church that has it all. The doctrine is sound, and it's good, it's wholesome, it's biblical. There is a keen and earnest attention towards evangelism. There is a healthy children's work. There are fellowship events on a regular basis for the congregation to uh, take part in. There is a good church structure, elders, deacons and a regular pastor, a minister. And indeed the building uh, is used frequently. In fact you would find that probably it's open for one reason or another every day of the week. And that's much to be commended. That's much to be emulated. There's nothing what I've said there that we must disparage. We must admire. And yet, something is missing. What is it? I'm not going to answer that question directly or immediately. But I'm hoping that under God, this passage might shed some light on it. Let's come to the passage itself. Verse 9. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. Now the occasion is Solomon has built the temple. It took him several years to do that. And now it's being commissioned for the first time. And a great ceremony of consecration is taking place. And in verse 6 you will see that they brought up the ark. It was previously in the tabernacle. Now they brought it to put it in this stone building, this temple. But we are told here that there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone. Sometimes what you don't see in scripture is just as significant as what you do see. If you turn to the book of Hebrews, for instance, chapter 9 and verse 4, you will find that there it says that there were two other objects in the ark as well as the tablets of stone. The tablets of stone had written on it the law of God which God had given to Moses at Sinai. What else was there? Well, there was a pot and in it was the manna which had fed the people throughout their 40 years of wilderness journeys as they came out of Egypt. And also Aaron's rod or Aaron's rod. The rod that had been used to perform the miracles in Egypt and which on a later occasion had budded. There it was in the ark, but it's not there now. Neither is the pot of manna. Does that mean anything? Well, it suggests to me, if you think about it, that rod and that pot of manna had been miraculously preserved. A rod in itself is just a stick, nothing more. A pot with manna in it, well, if you read the book of Exodus, the manna very easily rotted away within a matter of hours, and yet it was preserved in the ark. Why? God was reminding his people of how he had met with them, and how he had fed them, and how he had done marvellous great things with them, through them, 
by his power. But those things are gone. What's happened to them? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. It may be that they've been carelessly lost. It may be that somebody has thought they had no significance and discarded them. I doubt that. The priests were entrusted with the careful maintenance of these things. Perhaps they were taken by the Philistines many years before when they captured the ark in the days of Eli the priest, recorded in the book of Samuel. Or perhaps they've rotted away. After all, a stick doesn't last forever, and manna certainly doesn't. Well, what does that tell us? We need to be careful we don't read too much into it. But we know when we study the Old Testament that Israel had a history of frequent backsliding. There were times, many times in their history, when they lost something of true religion and they lost something of the presence of God and the sense of his glory. And perhaps it is that during those occasions, these things have gone by the way, disappeared. A symbol of their backsliding. But there's still the tablets of stone. Still the word of God. God has preserved that. And that's significant. As we shall see. For he visits these people again. Here in this passage. With his presence. Verse 10 and 11. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place. That the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. God's presence returned. And he manifested his glory in a visible, physical, tangible way. Now what we're looking at here, and this is where I need, say we need to be guarded, is a matter of revival. And the problem for us is that people have different understandings of what that is. So let me say what I see it as, and what I see here in this passage. It is God visiting his people and renewing the vitality of their relationship with him. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, uttered these words. One of the reasons for his coming, he said... I am come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. Now, every Christian has the life of God in their soul. Can't be a Christian without it. But the question is, do we have it more abundantly? Clearly, there were times in Israel's past when they didn't. And there were times when they did. This cloud, verse 10 again, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place and the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Then verse 12, then Solomon spoke and the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. What's that all about? Well, it's taking us back to what happened during the Exodus journey and the taking of the children of Israel out of Egypt and eventually after 40 years of wandering into Canaan. And this cloud played a most significant part in that journey. And it served two functions. It was a visible representation that God's presence was with them. But it also shielded them and protected them from the essence of God's glory. God's glory is a consuming fire. It must be approached reverently. And that's something that we all need to take note of, especially when handling a message such as this. Let me just turn you back to the book of Exodus. Once we're there, keep your finger in it, because I'll be reading from a few passages from that shortly. But first of all, let me take you to chapter 34. In fact, I'll begin with two verses in chapter 33. Verse 20 of 33. <coughs> you remember that Moses had said, and it's recorded in that 33rd chapter, he'd said to God, show me thy glory. He'd known much of God's power. The ten plagues of Egypt, all wielded through that stick by the hand of God. He had seen 
the people brought out of slavery and set free by the hand of God. And he wanted more. He wanted more of a deeper relationship with God himself. Show me thy glory. And this is what God said to him. Verse 20 of 33. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. Then verse 22. God doesn't leave it there. He still promises to do something for him. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Now, God is spirit. He's not physical. He doesn't have a physical hand. So how did this happen? Well, it's in the next chapter, 34 and verse 5. Now, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. That cloud served of this hand to cover Moses' face and shield him from the essence of God's glory and protect him so that he could learn more of God without being destroyed. And that, I would say to you, is our task. It's incumbent upon every Christian to learn and discover more of God. But we need to understand that we do it in trepidation and it can only be done in a certain way. Well now, I want us to consider the presence of God with his people and particularly his revival of it. Note I say his, not ours. We don't produce this, he does. And I want to begin with this cloud which is referred to in 1 Kings 8 and as we shall see in several parts of the book of Exodus. The Hebrew rabbis gave it a name. They called it the Shekinah, or if you like, the glory cloud. And as we notice here in our passage, 1 Kings 8, as the ark was brought into Solomon's temple, this cloud appeared, filled the temple, and in such a way that the priests had to get out of the temple. They couldn't stay there. They couldn't continue with their ministering. They couldn't do what they were required to do. Such was the presence of God. Well, this cloud first appears, or is first recorded, in the book of Exodus. We've just noted one incident of it in chapter 34. But I'll take you back in Exodus now to the, ni to the not to the 90, to the 14th chapter. Exodus 14, verse 19 and 20. Here the children of Israel have just left Egypt. They're approaching Mount Sinai. They haven't got there yet. And you remember they've got to the Red Sea and they can't pass it, and the Egyptians have pursued them. Here we read this in Exodus 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, let me pause there, that's a reference to Christ himself. When you see that term, the angel of God in the Old Testament, it is often, perhaps not always, but often and most frequently referring to Christ. The angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one that's the Egyptians and it gave light by night to the other so that the one the Egyptians did not come near the other all that night there it was a shield of protection against the enemies of God. That's perhaps the first recorded incident of it. You'll find it several times recorded in Exodus. Chapter 19, for instance, on two occasions. Chapter 20. But I just want to turn you to chapter 24, which is very significant. And to verse 15 to 17. Again, this involves Moses. One of the occasions when he was summoned to go up Mount Sinai. Went up more than once. Then Moses went up into the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. 
Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. There we see its double function. On the one hand, manifesting the presence of God. On the other, shielding from the consuming fire of God's glory. And of course it goes on in the book of Exodus. We are told indeed, are we not, that it went before the children every time they struck camp and moved on in their 40 years of wandering. And then when it stood still, they had to uh, erect the camp again. But you'll find that it continues right until the end of the book of Exodus. So let me turn you to Exodus 40, the last book of that, uh, the last chapter of that book, and read just verse 34 and 35. <coughs> then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. Now, by now, Moses has been at Mount Sinai. He's received the word of God. He's got the law written on the tablets of stone. And he's got the instructions of the Levitical law. And he's got the instructions to build the tabernacle. And he must build it according to the pattern that God has given him. And he's built the tabernacle, the tent, the tent of meeting. And now he's going to open it, consecrate its use. Now, here is a parallel to what we've got in 1 Kings 8. Solomon had built the temple and he's consecrating it for use. Here, Moses has built the tabernacle and he's consecrating it for use. Look what happens. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It's exactly the same thing. God comes down in such a way, he manifests his presence in such a way, even Moses couldn't go into that tabernacle and continue with his ministerial duties on that occasion. Now, what's all this got to do with us? Because God doesn't appear in a cloud today. What about New Testament times? Well, the first thing we need to note is this when we consider New Testament times. Our greater privilege. We have a greater privilege, even than that, to enjoy God's glory. How? We enjoy it in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true temple, the true tabernacle of God's presence. The New Testament makes that clear on many occasions. He said it to the disciples. It's recorded in John chapter 2, when he said he would destroy this temple in three days and rebuild it. But he was referring to the temple of his body. God dwells in all his fullness bodily in Christ Jesus. He's the very image, the express image of God. He is the glory of God. And every Christian is inseparably united to him. And he to us. Now, what about this glory? We have a preview of it given to us by Christ himself during his incarnation. Let me turn you please to Matthew's Gospel. It's recorded in Matthew and Mark, but we'll turn to Matthew chapter 17. You perhaps know this well. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 1 to 5 of Matthew 17. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered, Peter doesn't know what to say, it's fairly clear, he's bumbling like a bit of an idiot at this point. <coughs> Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
But then note the following verse, verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. That cloud. It's the same cloud that went into Solomon's temple. It's the same cloud that went into Moses' tabernacle. You'll find it in other portions of the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter, chapter 6, where he sees the Lord lifted high. You read that chapter when you've got a chance to yourself later on. And the opening verses tell us that the cloud appeared to Isaiah. Ezekiel chapter 10. We all remember, of course, don't we, the cherubim appearing as wheels with eyes all around them. But you read the opening verses of Ezekiel chapter 10. The cloud appears. The presence of God. It's there throughout the whole of the Old Testament. And it's even here in the New. But what about you and I? Because as I just said a moment or two ago, we don't see it today. Does that mean we're at a loss? Quite the opposite. We have more than they had. When the Apostle John wrote his Gospel, in the opening chapter and verse 14, he recalls these words referring to the Lord Jesus. He dwelt amongst us and became flesh. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when he writes his first epistle, in the first three verses of that epistle, John clearly is still taken up with it. Remember, he'd been there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there when the Lord Jesus allowed the veil of his flesh to be parted, as it were, and the glory of God to be seen. That's what was happening there. Wesley records it in his hymn, doesn't he? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity. Well, in his incarnation, people couldn't see it. I don't know how that's possible, that God's glory could be hidden, but it was. And then it was parted for a moment, and those disciples saw it. And they never forgot it. John never forgot it. So he opens his gospel with it. And he opens his first epistle with it, and he says, we touched him. We handled him. We sat with him. We ate with him. We drank with him. Can you imagine how taken up he was with that? How astonished. But again, I say, what about you and I? We have a union with Christ. And we'll come to that in a moment. But before we do, let me say something else that John himself said. Right at the end of our Bible, in Revelation, and in the 21st chapter, listen to this carefully. Here is John recording the very last book of the Bible for us. How does it finish? I know there's another chapter, chapter 22, but here in chapter 21, he's beginning to see and show to us and explain the city of God which has come down to dwell upon this earth. A new heaven and a new earth created with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he say about it? Revelation 21 and verse 22, But I saw no temple in it. There was no temple in that city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. What about it? Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine. Why? For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. If your soul is knit together with Christ Jesus, you have a taste of God's glory. Now let me say a little more about that because it's so important. I know I'm flitting from scripture to scripture, I apologise. But I want to be careful that I bring to you something God has said, not what I've said. So let me turn you to Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. I'll begin with verse 1, but it's verse 2 that we need to look at. Romans 5. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is all about a Christian who is justified by the atoning work of Christ <coughs> Jesus and has been given faith from God to lay hold of that and has peace with God, no longer an enemy of God. What about it? Verse 2. Through whom, that is through the Lord Jesus Christ, please note that, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now what's that saying to us? Let me just stay with it for a moment or two. We are told we have access. And that really means we have an introduction. We're approaching a monarch. Please note that. When you approach God, you're approaching a king. And not just an earthly king. But a king who is the very king of this universe, the very creator of all things. A king beyond all description and beyond all measuring. Now, if you approach Queen Elizabeth II, you'll have to go through certain procedures. You'll be told what not to do and what you can do. You'll be told what not to say and what you can say. And you'll be told you must only speak when you're spoken to. And somebody will introduce you. Joseph did that with his family in Egypt, didn't he? Recorded in Genesis, in the 42nd chapter. He brought his brothers and all their family and Jacob, his father, down from Canaan into the land of Egypt because of the famine. But he had to present them to Pharaoh. And he introduced them to Pharaoh, to the monarch, to the one who had the power of life and death over them. He gave them an introduction, took them into Pharaoh's presence. The Lord Jesus Christ does that with us. And he takes us into the presence of God, the Father. What else we read here in this verse? In this new relationship, we stand. Now, it's not referring to physical standing. It's referring to that idea of something that is established. That's why I read verse 1. This is something that is ours from the moment we are justified by faith in Christ. And it stands, it continues to stand, it's permanent. It isn't something that is there today and gone tomorrow and perhaps back again the, other, the day after. It's continuous. It's irrevocable. It's unchangeable in one sense. It's never removed. God doesn't take it back from us. Now we need to come back to that in a moment because it's important. It's permanent in other words. We stand in this relationship. What do we do in it? The end of verse 2. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in God's glory now. Paul expresses it in this way, in hope of the glory of God. And he's saying two things in a sense. We have something of it now but there's something even more to know in the future. And I read it to you a moment ago from the book of Revelation. Moses had to be shielded by a cloud. So did the priests ministering in Solomon's temple when the presence of God appeared. We are shielded by Christ himself. He protects us from the consuming fire which is God's glory. Otherwise, we dare not approach him. A day will come, and we hope for it, not some vain kind of hope, it's a certainty, something we know is going to happen. There in Revelation, what? In that new heaven and that new earth, it will be ours without interruption, without obstacle. The glory of God will so shine, and we will so dwell in it, that will be no need for the sun or the moon. Well, let's come back to the present. Let me bring you back down to earth, as it were. If all that's true, what about the here and now? What about you and me today, the church as it is at the moment? Is it always like this? 
And we have to be honest and say it's not. And we need to think about that. Now, here we need to be, again, very <coughs> guarded. God's glory never fades. It's never lost. It's never diminished. But our sense and realisation of it is far from constant. Think again about that verse in Revelation. If there's going to be a day future when we will know it without any obstacle or interruption, clearly now we don't know it in all its fullness. We know something of it. But let me go a little further. There are times when we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul teaches that very clearly in his epistles. And God withdraws the sense of his presence. The Psalms are full of this, aren't they? How long will you be angry with us forever, Lord? And again, you read in the Psalms, when the psalmist likens the church to a vineyard and a vine that has been planted in it, and says to the vine dresser, that's God, oh, visit this vine. Clearly, in Old Testament times, it wasn't there all the time. That's clear when you look at what was happening throughout the book of Exodus, and then you move on from there into the book of, 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 of Judges, and, and, and uh, the book of Joshua first, and then the book of Judges. And you find backsliding Israel, worshipping idols, where's the glory of God's presence now? Well, it's still there, but they don't know it. And it's like that with us. There are times when we as individuals don't know it as we should. And there are times when the church doesn't know it as she should. The whole history of the church, if you read it from beginning to end, from Genesis right through to the present day, is one of constant backsliding and God then intervening and pulling them back and restoring them and visiting this vine. And it's for that reason that I think this is so important today. We're living in a day when People all around us know nothing of the existence of God. And the church seems to be nothing but water. Feeble. A small band of people who have certain ideas and that's that. It's becoming a byword in this country. But it's been like that before. And God has done something about it. Let me take you to another church. I began by referring to one which I think we should all admire in many respects. Let me take you to another. Because let's face it, in this day and age of ours, there are churches of all different shapes and sizes. I'm speaking in spiritual terms here. Uh, of all different persuasions and ilks and what have we. Let me take you to another. The people in this particular gathering, I want you to think now and use your minds again. Imagine, they like to put Christianity in terms agreeable to society. The gospel is an offence and they want to try and avoid that. They understand that God is perfect. They understand that God is without any blemish. But they don't see him as essentially different to us. Just a more perfect version of what we are. And so they often display a very sort of pally attitude to God and to Christ. They want to present Christians as being, in inverted commas, normal. They're frightened that if people see us as different, they won't listen to us. When it comes to the gospel, they present it in terms of something 
which is there to help you face your problems. To help you get through life's difficulties. They don't present it as something which is essential to enable you to stand before the face of God whose glory is a consuming fire. Let me just read you something. A magazine was pushed through the door of my house. It's not the first time it's come. I won't give you the title of it, but it does say this. Encouragement for today, promises and reassurance for every situation. And then it announces three major articles within the magazine. The first one, look up, you're not alone. Second one, a remarkable journey that will change your life. Third one, the key to finding strength when things are tough. Now let me say something, the gospel does all of that. A Christian is never alone. A Christian is embarking or has embarked on a remarkable journey that transforms the whole of their life. They're not running after sin anymore. They're desiring God. And when difficulties arise, and they most certainly do, there is a strength outside of ourselves we can turn to. But again, I ask you the same question that I did right at the start when we looked at that other church. What's missing? What's absent? Where is God in all of that? That's the question. Where is God in the message we give out to this world? Where is God in our lives? <clears throat> Let me draw this to a close. Let me say to begin with that I'm not trying to play off one church against another and say this is better than that. You'll find good and bad in every church. But what I am saying is there is one thing that is common to all. Where is God? Is his presence there? And so I ask the question, to you and to me, what are we to do? How should we respond? And there are three things. The first one is this. We need to desire the glory of God. But please be guarded about that. Recognise it can only be known on his terms, not ours. And only he can produce it, we can't. There are those who try to generate it for themselves in some wild excitement. That's not what I'm referring to. And recognise, please, it is an immense privilege to be invited to dwell in God's presence. And that's what the gospel does. That's the first thing. We need to address our own hearts in this matter. But secondly, we need to pray for it. For ourselves individually and for the church corporately. Now, what we are contemplating is something which historically has been referred to as revival. And as I said right at the outset, I'm rather scared of putting it that way because I know that different people have different views of it. Let me tell you that revival humbles. When revival comes properly, we're conscious of our sin and we recognise the debt we owe to God. And we even find ourselves confessing it publicly. And what a thing that is to do. But it's something we should pray for. I want to quote something to you before we close. This is a book on the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ, written by a man called James Montgomery Boyce. He studied at Bern University in Switzerland. <coughs> started a Christian union in that church, in that uh, university, which became a church which is still in Bern to this very day. I've worshipped in it. 
When he left Switzerland, he became a minister of the gospel and ministered in the United States in Washington, D.C., in the First Presbyterian Church on Capitol Hill. He died prematurely in 2001, I think it was. But he had a most remarkable ministry. And here, speaking on Luke chapter 11 and the parable of the midnight visitor, you remember somebody came and visited a friend at midnight, he had no food, so he had to go to the neighbour and the neighbour wouldn't get up, so he kept on pestering him and saying, give me what I need. And he's saying, what should we pray for in such a fashion? He says this, Jesus told us to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. If you can pray for nothing else, you can pray that God will raise up workers and send revival to our land. I often hear people praying that God will raise up workers, but they don't seem to pray for the power that's necessary to go with it. He then goes on, and he refers to a man called R. H. Torrey, or R. A. Torrey, I think it is, R. A. Torrey, who wrote a book on prayer called The Power of Prayer and The Prayer of Power. And he summarises something that Torrey says in regard to praying for revival. And then at the end he quotes Torrey himself. Now, I've looked at what Torrey said, it's quite lengthy, so I'll refer to this instead. This is what Boyce says, summarising Torrey's uh, book. The Great Awakening under Jonathan Edwards began with his famous call to prayer. And it was carried forward by prayer. The contemporaneous work of God among the North American Indians under David Brainard, Edward's friend, began in the nights Brainard spent in prayer for God to effect that great work. In the 17th century, a revival began in Ulster, Ireland, that eventually spread throughout the whole country. How did it begin? It began with seven otherwise undistinguished ministers who committed themselves to pray regularly, fervently and persistently for revival. The same was true of the Wesleyan revivals at the time of Wesley and Whitfield began their work. England was in a spiritual torpor, a moral abyss. If you've read Arnold Dalamore's work on the life of George Whitfield, you'll realise that. Conditions were appalling. But a little group of believers began to pray and God heard their prayer and sent a revival that transformed England and even spilled over into the New World, that's the United States. In the 19th century, the revivals under D.L. Moody and others were carried on in a spirit of prayer. Can we not have that today? One writer says, and here he quotes Torrey, It is not necessary that the whole church get to praying to begin with, although that would be wonderful. Great revivals often begin first in the hearts of a few men and women whom God arouses by his spirit to believe in him as a living God, as a God who answers prayer, and upon whose heart he lays a burden from which no rest can be found except in importunate crying unto God. Then Boyce continues, have you nothing for which you can persevere in prayer? Then persevere in prayer for revival. So there's two things we should do. And I'm conscious time is going, so let me move on quickly. Desire. That's the first thing. Secondly, pleading with God. Don't try and work it up yourself. That's utter folly. What's the last thing? Realise the importance of it. That, I trust, has come through in the message itself. But let me then stress this as a final thing to leave with you. It transforms the church. So that those in the world who have nothing to do with God become interested in her and in her message. And they inquire of God and ask, what must I do to be saved? And in order to stress that, I'd like to give you a final quote from another book. This man is called Brian Edwards, Brian H. Edwards. He ministered in this country for quite a number of years. And he wrote two books on revival. This is one of them. 
And he gives an account of some of the revivals that have turned out in the history of our land. This one that he refers to here, and I hope I can pronounce it correctly, took place in a place called Ross Flanagrugog. I won't ask you to repeat that. <laughs> well, I'll simply say it's nowadays referred to as Ross or Ross. It's in North Wales, very close to Wrexham. And he refers to an account that was given by somebody who experienced what took place there. He was a teenager at the time. His name was John Powell Parry, known as Powell Parry. Um, he was a miner, He'd been in the mines since the age of 14, and he was 18 years old when things began to happen. Now, the revival began in 1904 in South Wales, but in 1905, it came to North Wales, and it came to this particular village called Ross, as we shall refer to it, when a Welsh Baptist chapel asked a man called Rhys Bevan Evans from South Wales to conduct a mission there. And he came, things began to change. Now, let me just explain some of the, the detail. It was a mining village. And the pits worked uh, an 11 day fortnight. In other words, you worked throughout the two weeks and on uh, the Monday of the second week, you got an extra day off. And it was referred to as playing Monday. Obviously that was a day of recreation, that's significant. So what happens? Well, this revival took place, uh, and it took place, first of all, in this particular chapel, but it spilled over much wider than that. He refers also to what used to take place within the chapel. There was a large pew at the front. Many of you will know this if you've been in Welsh chapels. It faced the congregation, and two elders would sit in it, and they would make sure that whatever was preached was biblical and not something else. So, this is what he says. As the news spread of the revival, people travelled from all over Wales to see what was happening. Then they came from other parts of Britain and from the United States, Canada, Australia and elsewhere. Many of these visitors carried the revival away with them to distant parts of the world. Such was the presence of God that it could be felt by visitors as soon as they entered the town. And even beyond this, Powell Parry comments, the presence of God was everywhere, not just inside the chapels. As an example of this awareness of the presence of God, Powell recalls a story on a, of an event during the summer of 1905. When a Christian man arrived in Ross with his two daughters from Barrow in Furness in northwest Lancashire. He came to the big pew in the Baptist chapel and told his experience to the congregation, which included the teenager Powell Parry. This Lancastrian had read of the revival in his daily paper. Can you comprehend that? Mm -hmm. A work of God being reported in daily papers. And one of his daughters had suggested they might go and visit the town to see for themselves what was happening. Listen to this. They caught the Sunday midnight slow train and arrived in Chester Station at 6am. Not knowing where to go from here, they asked a porter. How do we get to the place where the revival is? They were told there would be a train at 8 a.m. to Wrexham. And from there, they could catch a local train to Ross. Now, Ross is three miles outside of Wrexham. But how will we know when we are near Wrexham? They said to the porter. Oh, replied the porter, you'll feel it in the train. And they did. There was an unmistakable expectancy in the air. Two miles outside Ross, they inquired again and were told, go down that road and you will feel it down there. In other words, feel the presence of God. It was 9am 
on a playing Monday. When the visitor and his two daughters arrived at the chapel to find it already full of worshippers who had been there since 7 a.m. There were no special meetings for young people. They all came to the adult meetings. Even children of six and eight years of age were talking about Jesus. Even though they were not all converted. And teachers would weep as they overheard the children's conversations. The effects of this revival continued right up until the Great War of 1914. Prayer meetings were changed and revitalised. It didn't just stay in that area. Cheshire, what is now Merseyside and Greater Manchester, and Lancashire were also affected by it. Quite a number of churches were established in the early part of the 20th century as a result of men who were converted in that revival and went out as missionaries to preach. <coughs> That's what God does. Not you, not me. He graciously uses us as instruments in it, but that's all we are. And may it please him to do it again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have but one thing to say. Would you graciously visit this vine? Father, stir our hearts. Draw us to yourself and make your presence known and transform this very land in which we live for the glory of your name and the honour of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing our final hymn together, which is in the hymn book 373-70. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, for what a foretaste of glory divine. And after the singing of this hymn, Alan will take the communion service. 370. Filled with his goodness, lost in his 
And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. I will sow among the peoples and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful atoning sacrifice which the Lord Jesus Christ was and offered for our salvation. Lord, as we take this bread, remind us, I pray, of the wonderful grace and love which sent the beloved to Calvary. Let's take of the bread. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord. O oh Lord, we thank you that the great shepherd, the father's companion, 
was struck. That our sin might be atoned for. Let's take the cup. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. <clears throat> Lord, as we close our time together now, having thought upon the sacrifice which the Lord made for our salvation, having heard of the glory of God, having heard of revival, Lord, I pray that as we go out from this chapel today, that you might indeed revive your people, that the towns and the villages about us might themselves feel the glory of God among us, we pray. And now, may the God of peace sanctify you through and through, <coughs> body, soul and spirit, so that you may be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Even so, Lord, come quickly. <coughs> Amen.